That was, of course, the great Steve Gadd. Steve is a master of drums, all different styles, rock, jazz, pop. He's played with every legendary artist you can think of. James Taylor, Paul Simon, Eric Clapton, Chick Corea, Steely Dan. He's known for such famous beats as 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover or the drum solo in the Steely Dan song, Asia. I got a chance to sit down with Steve this past weekend. Here's my interview. Steve, welcome. Thank you. We are both from Rochester. You are from Irondequoit. Tell me about your upbringing. My first three years, we lived with my uh, grandparents and my father's brother on uh, Pearl Street. Okay. And then when I was about three, we moved to Irondequoit. My parents got, you know, their own house. My brother and I and my parents lived there. Uh, I went to St. Ambrose Grammar School, okay. which was like a, a block away. We used to walk there. And uh, East Ridge High School. I studied at, at, in the preparatory department at Eastman while I was in grammar school and, and high school with uh, John Beck. John Beck, yeah. yeah. I, I had a good childhood. Grew Man, up. when I was growing up, they had a lot of, did you, you remember the Ridgecrest Inn? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which brought in all kinds of big name bands. Right. You know, and, uh, and it was a small club, and you know you could go sit right next to the bandstand and hear Gene Krupa, Dizzy Gillespie, Oscar Peterson, Ray Bryant, Carmen McRae, Dakota Staten, uh, Kai Winding. They uh, would do the circuit. Yeah, they would up. do the circuit. There, there were big name acts doing these yeah. circuits. Max yeah. Roach. And those days, the, on Sunday afternoons, they had like a matinee, a couple of hour matinee local musicians sit in, you know, so my family used to take me and my brother there to, to hear the music and, I, you know, on the after, in the afternoons on Sunday they'd let us sit in, you know, and Chuck Mangione and his family, Gap and Chuck, and they would be there too, so, there were, you know, we used to see each other all the time and end up playing with these, with these uh, big name uh, musicians, Art Blakey, you know, and these guys were very uh, nurturing. Yeah. Very, yeah, they were just um, encouraging. Is this where Chuck got connected with Eric Blakey through that, or was yeah, that Well, later? I mean, it could, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was. They, uh, he ended up, up going out with Blakey, yeah. Yeah, at, you know, and uh, him and Chick Corea were in that band. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, because we all knew these guys from when we, when we were kids. Dizzy gave Chuck a, a horn that you know the, where the the bell went up, <laughs> right. which Chuck played for for years until I think eventually it got stolen. Yeah, we were connected with some of those uh, those famous people, not in a real close way, but and when they came through town, they'd remember us. You know what I yeah. mean? And they would uh, Chuck his parents would invite people over for dinner. You know, a big spaghetti dinner. You know. Of course. And I just recently saw a picture of uh, Ron Carter and Dizzy over at uh, Chuck's house. Did you know Benny Salzano? I didn't. No, I didn't. He was a saxophone player. They mm -hmm. used to play with Chuck when they were kids. Uh, they used to go by the Little Giants. Good player. And uh, you know, unfortunately, he just he recently, you know, passed. We lost him. But someone sent a picture of him as a kid. In you know, in Chuck's house with Ron Carter and Dizzy Gillespie sitting at the table, all you know, getting ready to have a plate of pasta. When I interviewed Ron, I asked him about being in Rochester back then, and the, he graduated from Eastman in '59, and told him my dad used to bartend at a place, Joe Squeezer's Squeezer's Bar, band which box. Is, yeah, Joe Squeezer's yeah. band box. Yeah, exactly. Doug Duke used to play there with uh, Don Sheldon, and Frank Bruno was the bass player. Right. And I used to go, my dad used to take me down there, and, I, and Doug would let me play. Don would sit and talk to my mom and dad and hang, my, my uncle, and let me play. The whole, you know, it was so, it was... That was really a great scene, all, the, all the, these places, and there were so many excellent musicians, and people really valued it. So you got the band box, you got uh, uh, the lounge, the midnighter, mm -hmm. Ridgecrest Inn, the Pithod, Oxford Lounge, Shelma. And they all were bringing bands in all right. the time. And there'd be matinees that sort of overlapped on Sunday afternoons. So we'd start at the Pithod and, and, and go, to the, go to the Oxford Lounge and then end up at the Shelma. And, and everybody would be there. They even had some after-hours clubs for people to play. Like Dick Sakari had uh, 
You know, did you know Dick Yeah. Scary? Well, he had uh, that after hours place down near the Pitha where after everyone finished playing, you know, at two, they, they'd go and play till five, man, it was, it was crazy. So you came up through that. When did you start, like, what were your early influences of people that you actually saw play? Well, Gene Krupa. Yep. Um, Art Blakey, Max Roach, uh, Papa Joe Jones. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Jack Franklin was playing with um, Kai Winding. And this is amazing, actually, these people would, that you'd actually see these people. I, I'd sit right next to the bandstand and look at the drummers. Or yeah. That's the best way for me to, to learn. Yeah. A, you know, I, I like to be up close so I could see, you know, what they're doing. And, yeah. And they were all very um, open about sharing information. and It was great. It was a very loving and nurturing uh, Situation. I first got to know about you through your playing with Chuck. We were working like six nights a week at at the lounge, mm -hmm. with, you know, with Chuck and Gap. Then with with me and Tony Levin, we're working six nights a week with Gap as a trio mm -hmm. while we were in school. Chucky and I connected when we were young. We played like six nights a you know played. Uh, I worked in, with him and his brother when I was in high school. When I went to college, that's when Chuck went with Art Blakey and Chick Corea was in the band. And then when they left Art, Art Blakey's band, they came to Rochester. I was in college by then. I, I had transferred from Manhattan School of Music back to Eastman. Yep. So in the two years I was at Manhattan, Chuck was out with Blakey. And when I got back, we, he put this band together with Chick and Joe Romano, Frank Polaro and me. And we were playing at the uh, at the Midnighter, mm -hmm. uh, six nights a week, and it was it was fantastic. And you would be playing what? But standards, you yeah. know, and chicks music. Uh huh. Uh, you know, it was like those guys were. We were all into uh, Miles. Mm -hmm. As Chuck had always been into Miles. You know, he, he, Chuck, Miles was a hero. You know, of all of us, we used to wait for his albums to come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he you know he'd have great rhythm section Jimmy Cobb you know Paul Chambers or you know or Philly Joe, Wynton Kelly and then you know eventually Herbie and and Ron and Tony and all these the the rhythm sections sort of set the pace for how Miles was what the music was you know what I mean it, yeah and when Tony and and Ron and Herbie started uh, playing with Miles that was a whole different approach to playing than the 50s quintet ahead, right yeah and we were all we loved that you know what I mean and uh, and Chick really loved that kind of uh, looseness and freedom and um rhythmic understanding you know what I mean so you could play around with the time and but no always know where one was you know what I mean so that was a, a, a great experience for me. When they got off Art Blakey's band, and we were, I was in college and we were working uh, six nights a week, uh, I had a 22-inch bass drum that I had been playing. And during that gig, I bought like a, a smaller set, an 18-inch, because that's, like what Tony, yeah, that's what Tony was playing. Yeah. And, uh, and when, I, when I switched the drums out, Chick wanted to come and see the new drums that afternoon. And, and sat down and played the little kit. And it was, it, it was so uh, educational for me because I had been trying to figure out what guys like Elvin and Tony were doing by listening to records. Because those two guys, I didn't really see them play live. Yes. You know, the, they came after all of that. I was out, really out of Rochester then, you know. And there wasn't as much going on there. But so when I saw Chick, it made things clear that I had been trying to understand by slowing the LP down to 16 and dropping the needle to try and figure out what Tony did on that fill yeah. or what Elvin did on the fill, you know. And and you can only take that so far. And then when I saw Chick, just the way he sat at the drums and how, you know, he didn't play the hi-hat on two and four. It was just just free, but with form in mind, you yeah. know what I mean? Not yeah, yeah. just playing. I mean, there was like a, there was like bar structure and stuff. And it just, it, it just opened, yeah, it just put, I was able to put some pieces of the puzzle together 
be, from being able to see Chick of understanding things that I couldn't really decipher, slowing the records down, listening, you know. So, and uh, and I think what I learned was it's it 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 maybe it's not as really so important to get it exactly as the way the guy did it is to understand his approach and and you know so you do it that way and you get it as close as you can i mean if you can get it exact it's great but other than that if you can if you can uh, capture the feel and the essence of what he did musically you know th then you can start to apply it you know and uh, it was uh, it was good so you must have seen these guys play later on then, right? You saw Tony and Elvin play. Mm -hmm. And what did you, when you saw them play, did you say, oh, did it, did, or was at that point you had already developed your well, own you know, thing? Well, you know, I mean, that, I, when I saw them play, I mean, I had, you know, de, you know, developed my way of emulating those sure. guys. Sure, yeah. And, um, so, uh, you know, when I saw him play, I could either tell that I was, you know, on it or, or I didn't do it exactly the same way, but, but the intent was there, you know? So I got it as close as I could, you know? You're on a lot of those chick records in the, in the mid-70s, early mid-70s. Leprechaun and Mad Hatter and Spanish Heart, I think. Your, and, and friends. Your, friends, yeah. So that connection with Chick goes back. It goes way back. It goes way back. It goes way back. When I was in the Army, I went to New York to see Chick play at the Vanguard okay. with, um, with Ayerto and Flora and Stanley. Mm -hmm. That music just killed me. Mm -hmm. And hearing Ayerto play the, that stuff and the Brazilian stuff on a set of drums, the samba, I, it was, it killed me. I, I told Chick, I said, man, I'm, the, the music was great. And, uh, you know, boy, when I ever get out of the army, if you ever need me for anything, I would love to do it. You know, I just put it out there. He put a band together for when we were doing, when he was doing Hymn to the Seventh Galaxy. Mm -hmm. It was me, uh, Stanley, Mingo Lewis, and a guitar player named Bill Connors. Oh, yeah. And we rehearsed all of that music, and the band was great. But he wanted the whoever recorded to go out on uh, on the road. I had a little baby, and and it was I just it wasn't the right. It, it would would have been hard for me to be on the road, and um, it was a hard decision. But I, I had to you know. Stop playing with the band, and it was eventually, they got was Lenny and uh, Al Di Miola. Yep. It was like a return to forever. That's right. It was a difficult decision to give up that band. You know what I mean? But it was, you know, it was like I was starting to get busy in New York. During my first marriage, we had a, a, a baby daughter, Mary Beth. And so it would have been better for me to be able to work in New York and commute back and forth. So, uh, but it was hard to give that up because I knew that band was, was going to be... But Steve, Huge. you played. But you played. You played on many records with Chick. Well, that's the, the, the point during that is same the, time period. Yeah, the thing is, like after that, <laughs> right? He called me to play, and which was I'm so happy for yeah. that because I'm so happy that that didn't end our relationship because there was so much more music and uh, for 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 us to play together and and stuff for me to learn just from being around. It's interesting because yeah. Chick was writing a lot of music at that point that he had so many different projects going on that you could you could do those records really at the same time he had the other group going. He was, he's always, he was, he never stopped Chick. There's so many different things I want to ask you about as far as your, your drum kit and your setup and everything that you eventually got to. But I want to talk about these some of these records. I want to play a couple things from the uh, a couple things of Chicks, for example, like. <laughs>
remember these, you remember doing this, right? Um, yeah, we did that at, at Electric Lady and we did it live. Yeah, I mean. Were you reading charts yeah. or were you? You know, that, that session I, I was came at the right time in my life because I mean, I had, I had finished five years of college. I've been in the army for three years. Reading, you're reading chops every for, day. Yeah, I, I mean, your reading chops are good, determined by the <laughs> amount of reading you're doing. That's right. You know, yeah. and uh, so you could read anything. I, at yeah, that I was. Point. Yeah, I mean, I would attack it. The, the pages I read off the piano s score. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which had everything in because it. it was like trying to play. Uh, you know, come up with percussion for an orchestra. That you know, it was trying. That's the approach. I came to see you play with the three quartets group um, in Ithaca. You only played a few shows with Brecker and, and Eddie Gomez, you and Chick. Okay, it was 1981, and it was your first show, and you went to Ithaca, New York, and you guys had charts that were literally on the, going across this thing, and it'd be... I remember I Brecker a, move, moving stuff like that. It was crazy. Incredible charts. And this is what it would be like in the studio, we, right? I'd have to, there were, you couldn't put, you, I mean, there was no <laughs> way to, to, we'd tape it to the wall and then we'd, we'd have, you know, cymbal uh, boom stands without mics that we'd like suspend tape and, you know, and it would be all the way, you know, that's all you could see. You couldn't see anybody else really then. <laughs> But I mean, you know, I, I was hungry, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I was hungry for it and I loved it. And uh, and I mean, it was like, all of a sudden I, I had a chance to, to uh, apply everything that I had done up till that time and, and, and it helped me, you know what I mean? Now it, it'd be hard to do, you know what I mean? If you don't read every day and stuff, yeah. it's just, but you know, I was like in my 20s. Yeah. You know, so your tom sounds were very different. You had the really fat, lower tuned toms, and those are small drums. That's those are small kit. drums. That's a little kit that I that I. It's put so together. powerful. It's so fat sounding, though. That was a a ten, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Okay. On the floor. Would you have a eighteen as your kick there, or was that a twenty two? That was a twenty two. Okay. It was a twenty two Gretsch. Okay. And then I, I had bought I, I I bought some Pearl concert toms, eight of them, and they had one head on them. Yep. I had bottom heads put on all of them, and then I chose the ones that were the most tunable, and where I could you know effectively use them for different situations, so yeah. I wouldn't have to be changing gear. You know, if you got if you have. Uh, drums that have a tuning range that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to change as much, you know? And Bernie Kirsch, that was the first time that he had done, uh, well, that I had worked with him with Chick, you know? And that I think that was his first time working with Chick for Leprechaun, and, and they have been were together until he died from then, until he died. Bernie did all his, all the albums, did all the live shows for Chick. Wow. And he started out as uh, a house engineer at, at Electric Ladyland. When you would do a take like that, would you go back in the control room? First of all, you guys were all sitting around each other in the same room, correct or no? Was anything isolated? Yeah. No, we were gobos? all. I mean, there was a uh, the 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 electric plant had a had like a, a wall around the drums. Okay, you know, not a full drum boost, but okay, halfway up. You know okay. what I mean? So it blocked. But you could see. You could see, everybody could you, see each other. Uh, yeah, except when you put the music up, then you had to pick and choose who you were going to look at. You would know? you go in and listen to takes after you did them, or you just move on to other songs? No, we would, uh, Chick would listen, you know, we'd rehearse a lot and then do a take and listen and then do another one, uh, you know, but we he, re, he was really good at rehearsing the band. And the musicians were, for that music, I mean, their reading and their playing was, everybody it, it was, it was fantastic. All pros. If they haven't passed away, they're still, people that are still playing for, yeah. for a living, man. They had a string section on there. That, man, it was an incredible string Yeah, section. amazing. Um, great horn section. I, I think they had, uh, wasn't Eddie Gomez and Anthony Jackson? Both, both yeah, I think Anthony's that? playing on that track, but Eddie Gomez and Anthony are on that record. When I when you guys played the three quartets band, it was amazing because um, Chick said, this is the first night we're playing uh, we're only doing five shows or something like that. You just put out the record. 
which I love the three chord sets record. It's one of my favorite chick records and, and the band with you and Eddie and Mike Brecker and chick. It, that was just such an incredibly powerful group. I want to play something actually off that. Hate to stop that that's unbelievable how exciting is it to play with that group right there it was very exciting i mean i was at it was i was the right age mm -hmm. you know um to be playing you know i had the energy i was i was young i you know I was, you know it's like uh it was just the right time yeah perfect time for that there's a there's a power to that piece right there that is just with the vamp that you guys are just playing over the that intensity of that is to me indescribable it's as heavy as any rock thing can be it's it sounds it has the power of rock but the harmony of modern jazz yeah i, I was just starting you know thinking about you know when i listened to that uh what drew chick and i together i i, I mean i think that he appreciated my uh, love and, and understanding of jazz, of guys like, you know, Tony and Elvin, Art Blakey and Philly Joe, all the guys that he loved, because he loved those guys, he could play like them. But he, I, I think he also musically liked the, uh, my uh, understanding of the groove from doing some pop things. Yeah. You know, I, I, I and, or, and playing with a band called Stuff, I, I really understood yeah you know, how important it, the groove was. Because if you, can, if you can lock that in, then you can build the Empire State Building on top of it and it'll support it. But if it's, if it's not locked in at the bottom, then it, it's great. You know, it could be great and everyone could be playing great, but it doesn't have the cohesiveness of somebody trying to play underneath it and, and let everyone know what the form is without overstating it. But yeah. just, you know, just like, at the beginning of the phrase, you know, maybe accent the and of four. Not not one all the time. But you understand what yeah. there were ways to let people know where we were without like throwing it away and, and making it too uh, obvious, you know? And uh, and they liked that kind of tension. And because uh, they had, I mean, Brecker, man, he could just play forever. Yes. And Chick could too. They could just solo. I mean, to be able to be supportive and to go, not to make them go there, but to go with them. You know, it's, uh, 
it's a young guy's uh, thing, you know what I mean? I'm yeah. glad I did it when I did it. Yeah. And I'm glad they recorded it. <laughs> we could listen back to it. That that recording is incredibly, it's, it's so well recorded. It sounds so fat to this day. You hear it through here and it's just the bottom end is full. Kick drum is, you know, just Yeah, Bernie, you. he was, you know, Bernie knew, man. It was, uh, you know, I, I, I had some kind of uh, a, a technique uh, from being in the studio, mm -hmm. and a lot of those guys would do were were jazz people who did an album and go out and tour. Yeah, but not they. A lot of them weren't as interested as I was in the the pop kind of thing. Right. I saw the um, I I saw the challenge, and uh, and and the seriousness of people making pop records. It wasn't just. You know, they, they, were, they were serious musically yeah. about what they were doing. So I, I think that that helped my, uh, him, uh, you know, that awareness helped. This, it's pretty crazy music, but it's pretty cohesive to, too. You understand the difficulty of, the, of playing a part. I'm going to play you another thing here that's, that you've heard a million times. And this is 1975 or so. This is you with Paul, Paul Simon. Simon. This is one of the most classic grooves of all time. The problem is all inside your head, she said to me. To help you in your struggle to be free There must be 50 ways to leave your lover What made you come up with that drum groove? Well, if you play the next section Which I will The bridge, the, the chorus Yes uh, it's, uh, I'll, When it comes up, I'll show you yeah. the, 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 the chorus Total field place. change huh? It's a total field change yeah, there and that, But we were not we were playing the whole song at the beginning, like with a backbeat, you know what I mean? Uh, this fell into place, it felt really, really good. Okay. But the beginning, Phil and Paul thought they needed something. Like a signature or whatever. Whatever, you know, yeah. I, I, we didn't know where it was going to come from. Those guys knew that the, the chorus was cool, but the verse needed some work, and... and uh, and we did it at A&R 48th Street, and I was in a drum room, you know. And so I, I, a lot of times when I was in that situation, it wasn't easy to get out and get to the control room to listen to stuff. So, And, you know, I knew when it was, from working with those guys, when it was time to go in and listen. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of time when they're, they're just going through stuff and talking. And when they were doing that, I would <clears throat> be in the room and constantly, you know, what I did between takes was I'd be practicing different things, you know what I mean? To just sort of, that's what kept me, um, uh, uh, that was my creative outlet for practicing. Not doing it loud, not technically, but just these little different patterns and how to, you know, how to play the hi-hat with the foot and hit it with the left hand after. You know things like that, yeah. and they and they Phil heard me practicing that stuff, and I, you know I probably put it into some kind of little groove, and he said, "Why don't we try something like that for the verses?" It's all about trying to come up with an agreement with everyone, you know right. what I mean? So we finally reached the agreement, and uh, that was it. Lucky day for me. You were doing sessions all the time then. Tell me about that time of your life, mid seventies. Were you doing sessions in morning, afternoon, evening? What were you, with different artists, moving from studio to studio? What were you doing? Yeah, doing that, working at a club called McCall's. Okay. A band called Stuff. Yeah, I remember Stuff. Um, it was, a, it was a, a time in my life where everything that I had been working for musically was, you know, coming together. But my first marriage was, uh, we were having problems because we had two 
little girls and, and I was not, I was working a lot, you know, and so it felt like that there was a competition with the work, you know, which really wasn't there. But I mean, if you're a freelance guy, you can't, you don't get any work by saying no. That's you, say, right. you say yes to everything, right? whether it pays, whether it doesn't pay. You know, if you want to get in this business and, and you think you can play, then you take everything you can because the, the whole idea is to meet as many people that uh, that can play and hopefully they'll like you and they'll recommend you for other people. I mean, that's really, it's a word of mouth business, you know? Music was, uh, in those years, my, my, my marriage was uh, failing. My dad was, uh, was dying of, of cancer. And uh, so part of my, my, some of my personal life, important parts of my personal life were just falling, ending, falling apart. And, uh, and I used music as uh, an escape from, that was the only thing that I could do that made me feel like I was uh, being productive, that I was doing something positive, that I was uh, giving something to people that, and they appreciated it. Uh, other than that, <laughs> my life was, I was failing, you know what I mean? And uh, that's when I got into, uh, you know, doing drugs and stuff too, because I, 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 I was living in Woodstock and uh, Tony Levin was living in Woodstock and Mike Maneri and Warren Bernhardt, we had a band. And, uh, and I would go, you know, into New York three days a week and, and, and work and then drive back. And I started doing coke to keep me awake on the drive home, you know what I mean? So, so I was uh, using to work and then I don't know when it happened, I, because I didn't really see it happen, but I went from using to work to working to use. And I didn't even know when it happened, you know what I mean? That's how subtle and, and uh, baffling it, it can be. You were in Woodstock, traveling to New York, doing sessions. Did you, at some point, make it out to LA to live out there? Or did you always do your work in New York? I went to L.A. to work. They people they fly uh, you out there. Well, right? yeah, you know, a lot of times what happened is I'd <clears throat> somebody one per project would want me, and they I'd end up out there, and then I would let people know that I was there, and you know, other work would come in, or people would find out that I was there, and I'd get some calls. So you know, that's how I got work out there. Your discography, when when I look at up the things that you've played on. It goes on and on and on and on. I mean, it's amazing how many records you have played on. Do you even know how many? I, I don't, but I I know that it's, I'm a, I'm very uh, I mean, it's fortunate. Ins it's insane. You know, but I, I really feel lucky and fortunate. No, when you look about uh, look, look at how things are today, you know, I was at the, I, it was a good time for me yes. when it was happening because I don't know what would what I would do today. You know what I mean? It's like um, but during those years, it was just perfect. So I want to ask you about Asia. I recently interviewed Chuck Rainey. Chuck told me that this was an overdub, that you came in and played, and he wasn't there. He played bass on this. But he wasn't there when we did it, right? He said that, that you were playing to a click, he thought. He wasn't sure, but he thought that you played to a click. Because I've interviewed other people that have played on this session, and everybody has kind of a different story about it. You know, it. And I'll tell you, there's a, a lot of it that I don't remember. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry to say. I, I mean, I was. it was at a time in my life where, like I said, uh, you know, I was running away from uh, problems and just taking one thing after another to keep, you know, music was the thing that was was saving me. So, uh, you know, I had, I, they didn't call me, uh, hire me to go out there and do that. I was out there and I got a call because they heard I was out there and right. asked me to come in and do it. And uh, and I, I just, I heard that they had tried it with different people and, um, and, and you know, not that the stuff wasn't good, it just, they didn't, they were looking for something else. They, yeah, they were looking for something that it was hard for them to communicate what, what it really was. And you so, would have been reading a chart, right? I was reading it, yeah. Okay, okay, so then... So up. that part, that part that yeah. we're, we're listening to now is sort of like 
a pop way to try and play that stuff. It's like grooves. It's like the section repeats. You go back to the same thing. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's like or it's like a part. It's orchestrated. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's you know when you're playing that kind of music, that's what you try and come up with because it makes it easier to listen to. Yeah. It connects with the listeners, you know what I mean? And when it gets real busy, it's hard to connect, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's so Let me play the part with you, and for those of you, this is Steve playing a solo along with Wayne Shorter. Well, who, Wayne wasn't there. Wayne overdubbed. Wayne overdubbed. But, I'm, but I want to say that Wayne just, just passed recently. The the fact that that he's on it and we're playing together is... It's unbelievable, right? For me, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible... Uh, it was just incredible, because he, he was he is and and he's such a giant musically, man. You know, and I love the way he, when he was playing with Miles, the way they played together. And I mean, I don't know if anyone played with Miles the way like Wayne did. Man, he was you know unbelievable. And then the stuff he did with Weather Report. I mean, what an amazing uh, musician. And uh, so. The fact that I'm on a on a record with him is pretty incredible for me. Let me let me play this. These charts that you would have for a Steely Dan session like this, would this be an involved chart? Would there just be the basic kicks? You know, it was, I, I, the form was there. You yep. know, all the sections were there. I just remember trying to come up with parts that, that work musically. I think that we got through the whole thing. And, you know, when we got to the end the first time, I just played do we didn't. I didn't know that they were gonna put a solo over it or anything, and uh, but and I think that this is where they had a problem with other people. It was when they got to the end, they wanted it to go. Comp they wanted it to shift to go some completely somewhere else. Yeah. And you know, if back in the day, if you were called to do sessions, you know, that were pop things, the last thing you wanted to do was make it so crazy. Right. You know what I mean? You're yeah. trying to make it cohesive so people can understand it. So it, it was just hard to understand how crazy they wanted it because it was sort of a separation musically from what we had been trying to do, which yeah. was really, you know, orchestrate that arrangement in a way where it really felt good, you know what I mean? And then, and we had done that, but so to, to leave that and go to this other place was, it was hard to uh, to to understand that that's what they wanted. I mean, it's almost like you you go over the top, <laughs> and 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 you know you go you you don't know what, anything else to do, so you go the other way, and that's what they wanted. They yeah. wanted that kind of uh, that kind of crazy. But it's hard to explain that. Yeah. You know, if the solo's not there, but I, I, I and I think that that was. Uh, the, the communication problem that maybe w they had with other guys. Did. There's really not a tune that's like that either. This is a really unique song with a 
basically a drum solo and a sax solo going on at the yeah, same time. Yeah, for that period for of that time. For that period of time, is very unusual. And uh, But you could tell that those guys loved, they, they came from a, a jazz background. Yes. But they also, you know, knew about, they were smart and intelligent and used music to to make a living, you know what I mean? And um, and they were good at it. Yeah. So And so they brought a couple of different genres together in that song. Yeah. Are you surprised at how this is, this, you know, has lived a life on its own, this, this drum part? I mean, it's crazy how much... Uh, um, uh, notice how, how many people heard this song and, and and talk to me about it. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. I'm, yeah. I'm extremely fortunate. What was your uh, drum setup at that time? If if you were doing sessions and you were in town in L.A., hey, I'm here. Would you have a company that would bring a cartridge company bring your drums, a particular drum kit that you had out in L.A. That would bring it to the studio back then. What, what would what was your setup during this period? How, what was size drums? Were you playing your recording customs then? Some people had the budget to where you could car, get your stuff out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of studios had uh, like a house kit or something. Well, yeah, they had bass drum and tom. Yeah, and and and, and then you'd bring your own uh, pedals and seat and snare drum and cymbal stands and cymbals. Yep. So that could have been that. Would you always tune your own kit though before you, when you got there? I, was, I was, yeah, you know, in those years, yeah. Yeah. I bought some different gear when I got out of the army. Okay. I bought a set and I, I, I experimented with different heads, uh, you know, I, so I learned a lot about, um, you know, tuning from building that set myself and from trying different things. You always you played with a lot of the same players throughout your career. There, you know, these, these guys that would be on that would do sessions all the time. And were there people that, and you don't have to name people. Were there people that you would be like, oh, I'm psyched that they're on the session that I get to play with them because I really connect yeah, with a them. A lot of time in the '70s, I mean, getting called to play. You know, it's like. A lot of times, the artists that were were uh, had deals. I I didn't know who they were, but I knew all the sidemen that they were hiring, man, right. like uh, Will Lee or Chuck Rainey, Gordon, Edward, Richard T, Paul Griffin, uh, Frank Owens. Uh, you know, you I, I, all the Spinoza, Trope. Those being able to play with those guys was even. Uh, more exciting <laughs> than the, than than the, the artist, <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I, you know, because I didn't yeah. know they were young artists. They didn't sure. know some of the artists were were weren't that experienced. They were talented. Yeah, and they 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 were on their way to, but they the musicians were could help them along, and those musicians while they were helping the artists helped me learn how to help the artists. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, the, the 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 stars of New York for me in the '70s were the the guys that I wanted to do sessions with. You know, would you always know it was you if you heard a song on the radio and you were playing drums? No, no, not always. I mean, if I knew if it was a hit and I knew I played it, I would know. But sometimes, <laughs> I say, you know, I, I didn't I didn't realize because it wasn't like I was trying to do something for myself. I was letting the music dictate what I was supposed to do. So it was less personal. Steve, what do you do for warm-ups and things like that? I know that you have you have a rudiments or a gadiments. Normally before a gig, you know, I'll I'll I got these sticks with and uh, um, with rubber tips so I can play on a on a counter or on a table in the dressing room and, and uh, and what I would do, I would just go, uh, you know, just some rudiments.
you know, things like that. And I would do that before the gig for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and then go to play the show. And then uh, when, when COVID happened and I had, we had all this time, I figured, well, I got to, I don't want to, I don't want to let time, that, a lot of time go by and not do something. Sure. I don't want to have to fight coming back. Yeah. You know, so I, I started j just doing that little 10, whatever I did before the, the show. But there was no show, so, you know, 10 minutes would turn into an hour, two hours. And um, before I knew it, I was back into, you know, practicing again, and I started... You started new, writing new, these things yeah, down? Yeah, new things, new ideas and sticking started to, to come to me just from, you know, just from being in that zone. And, uh, and I started to understand about displacement. Mm -hmm. So, and once I got into that, it opened, uh, it's like everything that I practice now, if, you know, if I displace it, 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 it Explain becomes, that. Explain well, all right, that. so here, it's like, here. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like one, two, three, four. That that's the same thing that I did. Same sticking. The, the, the same sticking. But you're just displacing you displace where you started. It, and every time you displace it, yeah, it's like you're. It's like completely different. And, yeah. And so. But not in a way where technically, you're, it's technically the same, but mentally. In the brain. Everything, all those beats are in different places, so yeah. it's all new. Yeah. And when, and, and when you understand it, then these rhythms start to become comfortable. Yeah. And so it can, I'm, I think it's giving me like a, a, a new bunch of rhythms that I never thought of before. Uh, and that were, you know, uncomfortable when I first started it, but now they're now they're comfortable. And so there's new. Are, are you a drummer? I'm not a drummer. No. No, you're a guitar player. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Things have come to me uh, that uh, new stickings. That, and I've been playing my whole life, but right. I never thought of these things Amazing. before. Paradiddles are right. Yep. So paradiddles are, are a, 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 a basic rudiment that drummers use a lot, and it's like the single. Uh, they're mostly single beats, and they end with a double. Right. But now, yeah, I I sort of come up with these new things where it starts. You start with a double. Okay. And 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 you try to make most of most of the rudiment use doubles and and. And and only two sets of singles, so you can play them faster. So it's like, and and you can start these things with flams too. And then you can displace that stuff. <laughs> so all of that stuff, because of the displacement stuff, and because of, the, uh, of these, a couple of new th uh, um, ideas about sticking, yeah. to use, try to keep, do more doubles, and less singles because you can they, they, you can play them faster. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of you know. It's just everything is feels new to me. You know what I mean? Is it amazing after playing so long to come up with all this new? These I new mean, ideas? it's crazy, man. I can play something every day that I never played before, just based on 
on this displacement thing. And you know, I haven't even really tried to take it to the kit. I've okay. been just working it. I, you know, I, I, I did a book called Gadamans, and okay. I'm, and I'm still practicing because I, I, because I'm into it. Yeah. Because this thing interests me now. Yeah. And, and I love to share. You know, it's great to share with other drummers. That's we, we love to. I'm a drummer in spirit. Well, we, we I mean, I find that most drummers are, are more than willing to. <laughs> totally agree. Show their friend what they did. Absolutely. And, and. and and they get excited seeing them be able to do it, and they get excited being able to do it. And, and if you can do it together, it's even more fun. Okay, so one of the things, and I'd love to have you play on the drum kit for, for a minute, and uh, is to actually take it to the snare drum and bass drum, right? That would be the first thing to do that. What, what I would do now is probably just play the bass drum to keep time and, yep. and do some of the displacements around that i haven't really you know worked on it on well the let's can we can we try it out let's yeah, try it out we could try it out can you demonstrate one of the things you did on the on the table yeah so with I'll the snare that, and the uh, kick then like the warm-up one two three Keep them all in phrases, though. So, um, and for me, just the, the displacement thing makes <laughs> everything that I can take anything that I've ever played and it all and, and and displace it, and it's like starting over again. It's rewiring your brain. Yeah, though, that's to what do it this, is. Right? And the thing that's nice about it, it's not like you got to learn something new technically. Yeah, it doesn't change. Right. But it sure feels like it does. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask you. We talked on the break for a second about the kick drum when you got when you were developing that your recording custom. Your kick is maple. The toms are birch. But we were talking about the kick length being a di different. That when you played longer kicks, you felt like you didn't have the bottom end to your like to yourself. It's not necessarily what the mic was capturing, but you yourself. Yeah, I, there was too much. There was too much distance between the the batter head and the outside head. Nothing was coming back. Yeah, nothing. It was, it was just going out, and it wasn't coming back. If you shorten the length of the bass drum, that'll allow the shorter it is, the the quicker the the comeback is. I, yeah, I never realized that before. So I norm I like a 22 by 14, and I tried a, a 20 by 14, which was a, that's a standard size. And um, and we decided to go with 16 to just lengthen it two inches. I think you can go to 18, I, but I th that for me that's too far because the longer it gets, the the less I hear back. What's the first thing you do when you sit down to the kit if you're going to play a gig to warm up? Do try to keep this. That's starting the triplet with the left. You know, or, or you could start it with the right. Yeah. So 
so it's all those different things, you know, like, so you, that's starting it with the left foot, or this is starting it with the right. And I usually, you know, I usually double something on the right there. So uh, if you change where you're starting at the doubles in different spots, and then if you try to just continue that and play phrases over that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like depending on where you start that triplet pattern, it all changes what you're doing on top. You know what I mean? It's just, um, and you can apply it to, you know, you can apply, apply it to what you're doing on your foot. Just with the triplet thing, you could start it at one, two, three, four. That's playing the double on, on the right foot at the beginning. Now you're playing with a, with a double kick pedal here. Mm -hmm. And when did you start doing that? Probably the late 80s. Why would you do that though? Why it's, is it because you there were things that you wanted to play? You know, well, they're saying at the end of songs. Yeah. You know, when you when you got to play, you know, like uh, it helps. Yeah. You know, it helps for being able to play louder and 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 trying to make one leg play really fast. Yeah. You know what I mean, it evens it out a little bit more. So that's why I originally did it, and then the more that it's there the more you can, you start trying to, you know, apply it, you know yeah. what I mean? So. That's another way you can displace it. Like if you take four beats, starting with the snare drum, then the left foot, and then two on the right. Could displace them and do it in, in phrases and try to come back on one of the next phrase. So uh, you can work on your technique, you work on your time and rhythms. You know, it, it you, you just it just you have to start understanding new rhythms to 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 be able to make it comfortable. And, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, if it gets really comfortable, then you got a, a new trick that you could depend on, you know what I mean? It's great that you're <laughs> practicing and working on new stuff I, man, all the time. Man, you know, I, uh, for years, I mean, I, I didn't, I would warm up and I'd do gigs and I was working a lot, so I, it wasn't a lot of practice. But right. it's, man, when you, it's it's so nice to be, to to be back and, um, and I, I can do all of it on a table if I want. I mean, you know, to understand you know, what I want to take to the kit, you know? So it's like I can do it, take a pair of sticks with rubber tips and I can play on anything, you know? Don't you think it's incredible though that you can learn things, new things like that and... and Unbelievable for me. I've been playing my whole life and, and, uh, and you know, practice before the pandemic was just sort of trying to keep everything up to par. Right. You know what I mean? But now, Every, you, this is like, opens up a whole new ball game, you know what I mean? You know, new stickings start to show themselves. You yeah. Know I mean, it's like... How long does it usually take you to get something in your playing that you're practicing? Because I always ask people this. I remember seeing an um, uh, interview with Mike Brecker, and he said that he would have to practice something for about three months or so, and then it would start to creep into his playing, but it would be about that long. Yeah, this is different. You know, this is more of a, these exercises start to show themselves better 
when you play them longer. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I can I start using some of the some of the st stuff in solos. Yeah. Uh, uh, not a lot though, but I mean like. I'm still working on that stuff. You know? It's amazing. That sounds incredible. <laughs> that sounds incredible. And that's from that's 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 an exercise that came from taking this stuff, uh, which is not a flam paradiddle. It's one of those new stickings that starts out with a double and ends with a single. But taking it and displacing it. Just you can apply that thing, and it just goes on forever. You know, um, to, sitting here hearing you play is so incredible. If you want to play us out, I'll play a, a rudimental solo I learned when I was in drum corps. Okay, I, remember I played Crazy Army. You know, I, I play that a lot, but this is another Crazy solo. Army that was on Chuck. It was on Land of Make Believe. Yeah, no, yeah uh, Legend of the One-Eyed Sailor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll play that. Yeah. Now. That solo, I like that. I'll play one more. This was a Riley Raider solo from the 60s. These guys played it.
Perfect. <laughs> okay. Steve, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I really appreciate you taking the time. Such a such an honor to uh, to meet you and my pleasure. You play. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe we can do more. Absolutely. Love to. Yeah. Thank you. It'd be great. Thank you.